the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Good afternoon to you. Father Francis back once again on this, the sixth Sunday in Easter. As we look at our readings uh, this afternoon, uh, I want to make a, a point that some people might find kind of uh, interesting. Um, a lot of times when people look at Christianity, they have different modalities. I guess that's a good word to employ this afternoon, modalities. Uh, some Christians, for example, um, they believe in speaking in tongues. Um, some Christians uh, believe that it's uh, okay to have musical instruments in church and others don't. Uh, some Christians uh, believe that, um, you know, uh, what matters are the charismatic gifts. Uh, other Christians, you know, look to the primacy of the uh, Word of God as, as, as that's, that's the most important thing is the Bible. Uh, other Christians, you know, will look at and say, well, you know, it's important that, you know, we, you know, uh, have a lot of social programs in our church. Um, and lots of people will have different interpretations on the Bible and the church. You know, what should the church look like? What should the church be about? Uh, what does this Bible passage mean? What does that Bible passage mean? And so on and so forth. And so there's a lot of, again, modality or there's a lot of differences. Uh, a lot of people, you know, will look at one particular set of scriptures and say, well, if you don't believe this way, then, well, you know, I'm not sure if you're maybe even saved. Um, some other people might... Uh, say, well, if you're not doing these kinds of things, maybe maybe you're not really a Christian. Uh, it's interesting, as you look around here at CSP Solano, you're going to see a lot of kind of different modalities, different, uh, you know, different variations on the Christian message. And one of those uh, things that happens from time to time is I hear, you know, people come to me and they'll say, I want to talk to the Christian chaplain. Well, and I'm standing there and and then they probably recognize me as some kind of a minister, but because I'm wearing a Roman collar, they, they probably think, well, you're not really a Christian because you're, well, you're a c -c 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 Catholic. And it's interesting because the Catholics, well, you know what? <laughs> We're the first Christians, <laughs> essentially. Uh, we trace our ancestry, our uh, apostolic uh, succession, all the way back to uh, St. Peter, uh, who uh, was, of course, anointed by Jesus. But the reason why I say all that is because um, maybe I'd like to clear up a little bit of a misnomer. Let me ask some of you a question. If I asked you as a Christian, what was the, the source and the foundation of the Christian faith? You know, what is the author of truth or the source of truth and the foundation of truth? Uh, what would you say that is? Well, a lot of people probably have already said, well, it's the Bible, dummy. Everybody knows that. Well, isn't it interesting that that's not exactly what the Bible says? If you turn to 1 Timothy 3.15, you will see that the Bible says that the pillar and foundation of truth is not the Bible, but the church. Interesting. And that's what we discover this afternoon in the first reading from the Acts of the Apostles. There is this... Um, a little bit of dissension has a little bit of problems have come into the early church and some people have come to the Christians in Antioch and says hey guess what if you guys are going to be Christians you've got to become you got to do it this way and you got to become uh, circumcised according to the Mosaic law and it causes quite a quite a problem you know again here are some people from outside you know it's interesting we don't know who these people are uh, it's interesting that scripture and history are, seem to be have forgotten who these people are. We just know that they uh, were people who were trying to stir up trouble. And they basically said, unless you are circumcised, you are not saved. Sound like somebody you know? A lot of people run around and say, well, if you don't do this, then you're not saved. A lot of people do that today. And yet, how did they resolve this very troubling question. I mean, these people, I mean, how would you feel if somebody walked up to you and said, well, 
you're not really saved, how would you feel? Especially if you really had been believing that you're already saved. How would, you, well, how would you feel? What would you think? Well, clearly it would probably be very upsetting to you, especially if they kind of had something that seemed, well, maybe, hmm, come to think of it, maybe, maybe you've got a point there. I, I, I never stopped to consider that. And so what happens? Well, what do they do? How do they resolve this issue? This is, the, this is the very important thing that I want us to look at and think about this afternoon. How do, they, how do they finally resolve and come to some kind of a consensus about this whole issue? Well, my friends, it's interesting because what happens is that they consult the apostles and the elders and the church in Jerusalem. That's how this whole matter is resolved. In other words, the Christians get together and they begin to discuss and pray and, uh, you know, uh, pray and ask God to show them what they need to do. And then, of course, they send uh, Paul and, and Barnabas and Silas uh, to Antioch to give them the message of the good news. And it's interesting because they didn't go to a, say, a book or a Bible. They didn't go to scriptures per se. They had the, certainly they had the Hebrew scriptures, but there was no New Testament, you know, right at that time. There just wasn't one to consult. And so, what did, what was the authority? Where, where did they go to get something authoritative? What are we going to do to solve this problem? And again, it wasn't just you know a problem, somebody stirring something up and just causing trouble, but it asked a very important question. Well, wait a minute. You know, the Mosaic Law, that's, that's God's covenant. That's the Old Covenant, you know? And it's a, a kind of a valid question. I mean, as somebody who's sincere and thinking and, and trying to follow God's, uh, trying to follow the faith, well, maybe, maybe we should be circumcised, you know? Uh, and can, you can see that if, for a person who is truly trying to serve and please God in all aspects of their lives, that's not a really bad question. That's not something that you could just quickly dismiss. Again, we, we are able to maybe uh, think, well, what's the big deal? Of course, nobody would, would ever submit to circumcision today, which is true. But again, we didn't live in that cultural milieu, okay? And, but they did. And that again, that was a very powerful thing. I mean, you had to be part of the covenant. See, and part of the covenant was circumcision. And so, and when someone came and says, wait a minute now, how can you be a Christian if you're not a part of the first covenant? Okay, that's a good question. But how was it resolved? It was resolved by them consulting with the apostles and the elders and the church in Jerusalem. So I just wanted to say that because I think hopefully some people might have a moment to pause and realize that, you know, before you kind of begin to say who's saved and who isn't saved, we need to be very careful when we do that. You know, we need to be uh, very humble and we need to be, again, uh, someone who is devoted to the truth and the foundation and pillar of truth is, as the Bible says, the church. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.